So module eight, the nervous system and the endocrine system, communicating within the body. In this chapter, we're gonna talk about the nervous system and how there are two main nervous systems, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And in the peripheral nervous system has two nervous systems, the somatic and the autonomic. And in the autonomic has two nervous systems, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So we're gonna talk about all six of those nervous systems and then we're also gonna talk about the endocrine system in this module. So the two questions we're going to answer in this module, one, how are the structures of the nervous system linked, right? So I talked about all those different nervous systems and the various structures within them, we'll talk about those. And then the second question is, how does the endocrine system, endocrine system affect behavior? Um, the endocrine system deals with emotions and eating behavior and sleeping behavior. And so all of those definitely have an effect on our behavior. And so we're going to talk about that also in this module. So let's start out talking about the nervous system and the neurons, how they are linked within the nervous system. So each neuron in your body can be connected to 80,000 other neurons. So that just goes to show you how many neuron cells we have in our body, right? The total number of possible connections is enormous. If you think about, you know, just 80,000 other ones and other ones, other neurons, and in those neurons connecting to other neurons and those neurons con connecting to other neurons, you can see how the possible connections is just enormous. I don't even know if we have an exact number on how many connections there actually could be within these neurons making connections with other neurons. With the nervous system, the human nervous system uses two basic structures. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, we have two nervous systems. We have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And we're gonna spend the next couple of slides talking about these nervous systems and the structures within them. So the central and peripheral nervous systems. Let's start out with the central nervous system, also abbreviated CNS. The part of the nervous system that includes the brain and spinal cord. So the central nervous system contains your brain and spinal cord. The spinal cord itself, it's just actually a bundle of neurons that leaves the brain and runs down the length of your back. So as information, some stimulus, as we use that example we talked about previously, some stimulus hits your foot, right? The skin on your foot, you, you step on a sharp piece of glass. That information goes from neuron to neuron to neuron to your spinal cord. And then the neurons in your spinal cord, that runs up to your brain. Your brain figures out what that message is. The message then leaves your brain, travels again from neuron to neuron to neuron, down your spinal cord, and then to the muscles in your foot, and you lift your foot. So we have the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord, and the spinal cord is just a bundle of neurons that runs up and down the length of your back. It is the main means for transmitting messages between the brain and the rest of the body. Your spinal cord is key. We'll talk about in another chapter um, various injuries that individuals may have, and you may know of someone who has a spinal cord injury or someone who may have had a spinal cord injury. Depending on where that injury occurs on the spinal cord depends on whether or not there is certain types of paralysis in your body. Because if the spinal cord transmits information between your body and your brain, and there's a spinal cord injury, that message is not going to get to your brain. The spinal cord also controls simple behaviors on its own without any help from the brain. So this would be like in a emergency type of situation, right? Where sometimes 
you don't have time for the message to travel to the brain. And so it's almost like a reflexive type of action that sometimes some of the behaviors, depending on which behaviors they are, and they're usually of some sort of emergency type of situation, they can act on their own without any input from the brain whatsoever. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about these reflexes that sometimes occur. Basic definition, a reflex is an automatic involuntary response to an incoming stimulus. So automatic involuntary. You do not have control over it. It just automatically happens. We have two different types of neurons that are involved in reflexes. One of those are the sensory or afferent neurons, and they transmit information from the perimeter of the body to the nervous system and the brain. So those are the afferent neurons. They go from various places in your body to the brain. The other set of neurons are somewhat like the opposite. Those are the motor or efferent neurons. They communicate information from the brain back to various parts of your body, the muscles and the glands. I always like to tell my students the difference between the afferent and efferent neurons. So afferent is going to the brain, efferent is leaving the brain. So if you think about afferent, it starts with the letter A. Approaching also starts with the letter A. So the afferent neurons are approaching the brain. They're going to the brain. Efferent starts with the letter E. Exit also starts with the letter E. So the efferent neurons are exiting the brain and going out to the muscles and glands in your body. So again, if we go back to our example of stepping on a piece of glass, that information would travel from neuron to neuron to neuron to your spinal cord, to your brain. It would be traveling by the way of afferent neurons. Once that information reaches your brain, your brain figures out what the message is. The message then leaves the brain, travels from neuron to neuron to neuron, down to the muscles in your foot, and you raise your foot off of the piece of glass. So the efferent neurons are traveling away from the brain down to the muscles in your foot. So two main types of neurons, sensory or afferent neurons, and motor or efferent neurons. Okay, so this is figure one in module eight. This is on page 64 in your textbook. And this kind of breaks down how the nervous systems are set about, right? So you have just nervous system at the top, right? This consists of the brain and the neurons extending throughout the body. You have two types of nervous systems. You have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system, as we said, consists of the brain and spinal cord. The brain is an organ that is roughly half the size of a loaf of bread, and it constantly is controlling the various behaviors of your body. The spinal cord, as we mentioned in the previous slide, it is a bundle of nerves that leaves the brain and runs down the length of your back. So it transmits messages between the brain and the rest of the body. That's the central nervous system. Now, if we go over here to the left, the peripheral nervous system, this is abbreviated PNS. So if we said the central nervous system was the neurons of the brain and spinal cord, the peripheral nervous system is all the other parts of your body besides the brain and spinal cord. So it's made up of long axons and dendrites. It contains all parts of the nervous system other than the brain and spinal cord. Now, the peripheral nervous system has two nervous systems. One, is, one of those is the somatic division, and the other one is the autonomic division. These are opposites of each other. The somatic division is in charge of voluntary behavior. So things that you are in control of. 
The autonomic division is involuntary behavior. So I always think of autonomic and I think about the word automatic, right? When things automatically happen, you have no control over them. So the autonomic division, involuntary behavior, it's concerned with the parts of the body that function involuntarily without our awareness. Now, the autonomic division has two nervous systems. Now remember, autonomic means automatic, it's involuntary. So these two nervous systems, part of the autonomic, are going to be things that you are not in control of. You may not even be aware that they are occurring. One of those is the sympathetic division and the other one is the parasympathetic division. I always like to tell my students the difference between the two is that the sympathetic division prepares your body for a stressful situation and the parasympathetic division calms your body back down after that stressful situation has occurred. So the sympathetic division prepares your body for a stressful situation. I have a slide coming up here in a little bit that's gonna tell you the difference between the two and what behaviors of the body we're talking about. But I really like this slide because it breaks down those two main nervous systems and then the peripheral has two more and then the autonomic has two more after that. Figure two, this is again on page 64 in your textbook, and you can kind of see, right, you have the central nervous system, you have your brain and your spinal cord. And the peripheral nervous system is the spinal nerves outside of the brain and spinal cord, okay? So the central nervous system is just all the neurons in your brain and spinal cord, and then you have all of these spinal nerves outside of the brain and spinal cord that are going to take care of various behaviors. Let's spend a little bit more time talking about the peripheral nervous system. So the peripheral nervous system is a part of the nervous system that includes the autonomic and somatic divisions. We saw that on that flow chart two slides ago. So again, the somatic, oh, excuse me, before I get down to that, the peripheral nervous system is made up of neurons with long axons and dendrites, and it branches out from the spinal cord and brain and reaches the extremities of the body. So again, the peripheral nervous system is everything outside of the brain and spinal cord. Now, let's come back to this autonomic and somatic division. The somatic division specializes in the control of voluntary movements and the communication of information to and from the sense organs. So these would be behaviors that you are in charge of. If you look on page 65 in your book, it gives you some examples for the somatic division. Now, the autonomic division is involuntary. Remember, autonomic, automatic. So it controls the involuntary movement of the heart, the glands, the lungs, and other organs. Things that you are not in control of. I always try to tell people, you know, breathing is one of those behaviors of the autonomic division. And students will often say, well, I can hold my breath. That's a voluntary behavior. Yes, you are correct. But if you hold your breath too long, eventually you're going to pass out. Once you pass out, you're going to start breathing again. So breathing is really an autonomic division type of behavior. You can have control of it sometimes, but eventually it will switch over to that autonomic division behavior. All right, so let's focus a little bit now on this autonomic division because we said we had two nervous systems that came out of that. So activating the divisions of the autonomic nervous system. 
If you remember, I said the autonomic nervous system or autonomic division is actually split up into two divisions or two nervous systems, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So the sympathetic division, it prepares the body for action in a stressful situation. So it engages all of the organism's resources to respond to that threat. Whether it is getting ready to take an exam, if you are afraid of public speaking and you have to give a speech in class, let's say that you're walking home late at night and you hear someone walking behind you. So it's getting you ready for that stressful situation. We all like to call it the fight or flight response. Now, you can't stay in that heightened state for too long. That would not be advantageous to your body. So after the stressful situation has passed, after you are done with the final exam, after you are done with the speech, once you get home and you are safe, then your parasympathetic division kicks in. So it's calming your body back down after the emergency has ended. And as you're gonna see in the very next slide, the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions work together to regulate many functions of the body. So figure three on page 66 in your textbook, this will show you some of the behaviors of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So remember, the sympathetic here on the right, that is getting your body for a stressful situation. So it's going to dilate your pupils. It's going to give you enhanced vision. It's going to relax your bronchi, which is going to increase air to your lungs. It's going to accelerate and strengthen your heartbeat, therefore increasing your oxygen. It's going to inhibit activity. So blood is going to be sent to the muscles instead. And it's going to contract your vessels, which is going to increase your blood pressure. All of these behaviors, remember this is autonomic nervous system. You do not have control over this. It will automatically occur. It's going to get your body ready for that stressful situation. Now on the left hand side is the parasympathetic. So once the emergency situation is passed, now the behaviors of the parasympathetic. Again, these are both under autonomic, so you do not have control over them. So your pupils are going to contract. They're gonna go back to normal size. Your bronchi are going to constrict. Your heartbeat is going to slow down. Stimulating activity of the stomach and muscles is going to start again. And then it's going to dilate the blood vessels of the internal organs. So the right hand side, the sympathetic, prepares your body for a stressful situation. The left hand side, the parasympathetic, calms your body back down after that stressful situation has passed. The next slide I want to talk about the evolutionary foundations of the nervous system, right? Anytime we talk about evolution, we're talking about Darwin, survival of the fittest, right? Only the most fit species will survive and pass on their genes to the next generation. There is this area in psychology known as evolutionary psychology. And it's a branch of psychology that seeks to identify behavior patterns that are a result of our genetic inheritance that we received from our ancestors. Going hand in hand with that, we have a more recent area of psychology, which is called behavioral genetics. And this is the study of the effects of heredity on our behavior. One thing you have to keep in mind though with evolution is it could take hundreds of years for things to change. 
So we may find that something in our body is not necessary, right? And But that may take hundreds of years for it to no longer be needed. excuse me, I had to sneeze, the endocrine system. These are the chemicals and glands in your body, the endocrine system. So the endocrine, endocrine, I don't know why I keep messing that up, the endocrine system itself is a chemical communication network that sends messages throughout the body by way of the bloodstream. Within the endocrine system, this is where our hormones are in play. So hormones are chemicals that circulate throughout the blood and regulate the functioning or growth of the body. Hormones have a very big part in our behavior. If you think back to whenever you started your teenage years and you hit puberty, Hormones play a huge part in that. Later on in life, especially for women, your hormones again in your 40s start to take a different type of tract and it can again affect your body. The pituitary gland is a major component of the endocrine system and the, end, the pituitary gland is what actually secretes your hormones. So you have the endocrine system, the hormones are part of the endocrine system, the pituitary gland actually has or controls your hormones and secretes them. So the pituitary gland is the master gland that secretes the hormones and controls other parts of the endocrine system. So you can see in this picture, and this one is on page 68 in your textbook. This is figure four. So this shows the location and function of the major endocrine glands. The pituitary gland controls the functioning of the other endocrine glands and in turn is regulated by the hypothalamus. So you can see here that this part of the male brain uh, of this individual, right? They also have them in the female brain, but it's showing in this male, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Also part of the endocrine system is the thyroid gland and the parathyroid gland. That's in your neck region, neck and throat region. You have the pancreas and the adrenal glands, also part of the endocrine system. In females, we have the ovaries, and in males, you have the testes. Both of these, again, glands are part that are part of the endocrine system. <clears throat> 